first speaker is Harry Garud, uh, doing a talk on easy incremental builds with GHC 9.4. Um, uh, over to you, Harry. I'll let you get started. Go for it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, am I, were you expecting me to share my screen? Yeah, if you want to share this, if you have any slides to share, please do. Yes. Cool. I, okay. I hope. I, I think I'm not allowed to right now. I'm really host disabled participant screen sharing. Really? Oh, okay. Just so I, I, uh, that must be some security setting that I'm not aware of. So what I'll do is I'll make you co-host and that should give you God powers. Oh, nice. Yep. Yep. That's done it. Thank you. And I'll make Dimitri co-host as well. It's also helpful in case I lose internet connection, then one of you can take over hosting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, right. Huh. Okay. Just, it just occurs to me, I don't know how to make the uh, title bar go away, but no. Um, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, it's all, it all, it all looks great. I, I, I can see your uh, slides Perfect. perfectly. Thanks. Okay, cool. I'll just get started then. Great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for um, coming to my talk. I uh, want to talk about um, some investigations I did. Uh, uh, so this, this started about maybe um, a year, maybe a year and a half ago. I was, at the time I was working for Lumi um, and our CI was, so we had about 100k lines of Haskell in our back end and we were building all of it in every CI build and it was very painful um, and so I started looking into speeding that up and um, I yeah I'm just going to talk a bit about how that went I guess so yeah um, so yeah this it started to kind of uh, weigh on me a bit that um, we spend a huge amount of time recompiling the same code in CI over and over again. Um, this is especially, um, it's relatively easy to cache your dependencies in a Haskell project, um, but the majority of Haskell projects, I think almost everyone I've spoken to who uses it professionally and has a project of any significant size to build in CI. Um, it's very difficult to do anything other than just compile every single module every time, even if only one or two modules have changed. Um, and this means that we spend a huge amount of time waiting for all of that compiling to finish. So um, what if we stop doing that? Um, like we already have um, GHC already has a build system built into it, right? So like when you're developing on a Haskell project um, locally, uh, it's not the case that every time you make a change, you have to recompile the whole project from scratch. Generally, it's only the modules that have changed and perhaps also the ones that depend on the ones that have changed that need to be recompiled, right? Um, what, what GHC does is it keeps track of um, object files and high files from the previous build um, and figures out which modules have changed, figures out which ones need to be rebuilt, and then just does only the work that's necessary. So why don't we <clears throat> cache all of those files, all of the data it needs to be able to do that, and um, have our CI do the same thing? So this, this is the first thing I tried. And um, <clears throat> what I found is that everything was still getting rebuilt. So that was a little bit of a bummer. Um, so I started looking into why that was. And it turned out that it's to do with the way GHC implements, or rather used to implement, um, source file change checking, like determining whether or not a source file has changed since the previous build. So um, I'm just going like, to give you an example <clears throat> to illustrate how it worked before 9.4. Um, in short, the way it worked is that a GHC would compare the, the timestamp of the source file to the timestamp of the corresponding object file. 
And if the source file was modified more recently than the object file, then the module would be considered out of date and needing to be rebuilt. So let's say, um, for example, that we have a we have a Haskell project that we're working on. We've just created it. Um, it's brand new, and we've just created two modules called A and B. So we have um, source files a.hs and b.hs. We haven't built it yet, so there are no object files. Um, we've just got the source files and. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to represent timestamps as integers. So um, I'm going to say that at time zero, we've created a and b.hs. Um, now, when we build the project for the first time, of course, um, we have to build everything because we don't have any of the object files yet. So we build a and b, and ghc writes out two object files. Um, and <clears throat> these get a timestamp of one because we're going to say that the build happens at time one. Um, so what we end up with is two object files which have timestamps that are after the timestamps of the corresponding source files. So now let's say we do another build. Now this build is going to be a no op because nothing's changed since the previous build. And um, so what GHD does is it looks at the timestamps of the source and object files. It sees that all of the object files have a timestamp after the relevant source file, and it does nothing. Um, it determines that we don't have to recompile anything, which is great. This is what we want. Now let's say we modify a.hs uh, at time two. Um, of course, that's going to update the modified timestamp on a.hs to two. So then when we build again, GHC sees that a.hs has a newer timestamp than a.o, and it rebuilds a. Um, so we write a new a.o, uh, which so, so now the timestamp on a.o is three, um, but b.o is left alone because we don't recompile b because again, b's timestamp hasn't changed. Um, so that's great, that's what we want, right? Um, so now let's see what happens when we do the same in CI. So, what will normally happen at the start of a CI build is that you check out the repository. Now, let's say that this happens at time zero. So we get uh, a timestamp of zero on a.hs and b.hs. Uh, next, what we do is we restore the cache from the previous build, which includes object files for a and b. Now, what happens is that um, it turns out that the timestamps for a.o and b.o end up being before the timestamps for a.hs and b.hs. And the reason for that is that they were created um, during the previous CI build, which happened in the past. Um, so that then when we build, GHC sees that all of the source files have newer timestamps than the object files, and so everything gets rebuilt. Um, so that's, that's what happened when I um, first tried to set up incremental Haskell builds in CI. This isn't the only thing that could have happened. It's um, the, the timestamps are not necessarily always preserved when you restore the cache. Um, what could have happened is that we could have ended up with object files um, whose timestamps were newer than the source files from the previous build. And of course, in that case, um, GHC wouldn't have recompiled everything, but then there's a risk that actually you've missed um, you've missed modules that have actually changed. Like it's it's actually really bad if um, you determine that a module doesn't need to be recompiled when that's not actually true. Um, you can end up with incorrect behavior. You can end up with seg faults even. So. Um, yeah, this is really, really bad. So we need to make sure that we don't. Um, we don't end up in this situation. So I thought about this for a bit, and my personal view is that timestamps are pretty much meaningless for build systems, at least when you start to uh, use them in CI scenarios. So um, specifically timestamps for source files. It's my view that a build system that... Um, makes decisions based on the timestamps of source files is actually incorrect. Um, 
what we actually care about is the contents of the file, right? If the contents have changed, then we need to recompile. And build systems often use timestamps as a proxy for that. Um, and a lot of the time they do more or less work for that. Uh, they, they more or less work for this purpose when you're developing locally, but of course, they just don't really work in CI and it's very difficult to make them work in CI. Um, but actually there's a, um, there's a pretty feasible option available to us to make sure that we're not um, depending on a kind of inaccurate proxy, but we are actually, uh, we have a foolproof way of determining whether or not the contents of the file have changed. And that is to use hashes to hash the contents of the file. So, as of GHC 9.4, uh, source file change detection is based on hashes. Um, this is as a result of a patch that I originally put together um, early last year, and um, it eventually got rolled into a bigger patch that um, sort of changed quite a few things about GHC's built-in build system uh, in a really good way. I um, I'm really, really excited about all of these changes in GHC 9.4. Um, Matthew Pickering did um, most of the work, or at least a lot of the work on that, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I'm, I'm sure other people are involved too. Um, yeah, you, uh, I, highly, I highly recommend upgrading, um, at least as soon as the ARM arithmetic bug is fixed. Um, anyway, I'm going to try and stop getting distracted and carry on with the talk. So yeah, I'm going to go back to the previous example and illustrate what happens now as of GHC 9.4, now that um, GHC's change detection is based on hashes rather than timestamps. So I'm going to say that as before, we create um, two modules, A and B. Uh, we create the source files a.hs and b.hs. And now instead of having timestamps in this table, I'm going to have hashes because that's uh, what the change like checking is based on. So um, I'm going to pretend that these hashes are two bytes long for now um, because I can't fit a whole uh, real hash into the table. Let's say that a.hs has a hash of cafe to start with and b.hs has a hash of beef. Um, so as before, when we first build, um, we of course have to build everything. And um, <clears throat> what happens is that when we build, uh, GHC makes a note of the hash of the file at the point that it was built and saves that in the high file. This is a file that's produced and placed alongside the O file and it contains information about everything that the module exports. So. Um, um, among other things, it allows GHC to type check downstream modules without having to type check the original module again every time. Um, and yeah, those those files are now also being used to store the hashes of the last build. So after we build for the first time, um, the hashes we get the hashes written to the high files. So now let's say um, we do another build. Um, so what will happen is that GHC will start by computing hashes of all the source files again, and it will compare those hashes to the hashes stored in the high files. Um, and what it'll do is it'll determine that they're all the same, and so nothing needs to be rebuilt. Uh, now let's say we've modified a.hs again. Um, let's say that the new hashes feed. So um, when we next come to build, GHC will see that feed differs from cafe, and so it will rebuild a.hs and it will save the new hash in the new version of a.hi, but it won't rebuild b because the hash is match. Um, so that's fine, but we're not that interested in that scenario because that actually worked before. What we're, at least what I was more interested in is the CI scenario. Um, and so let's like see what happens there. So again, we start by checking out the repository. Um, let's say that at this point, the hash of a.hs is feed and the hash of b.hs is beef. Next thing we do is we restore the cache. Now, our cache needs to contain both the high files and the o files, um, at least. So we get the high files back when we restore the cache. And 
let's say that um, this cache is from the previous CI build, to be clear. Let's say that in the previous build, the hash of A was cafe, but the hash and the hash of B was beef. And then let's say that in this commit that we're now building, the hash of A has changed and is now feed. So um, when we build, again, GHC compares the hashes of the source files to the hashes in the high files um, and correctly determines that A needs to be rebuilt and B doesn't. And that's it. That's um, that's what we wanted. We wanted to only rebuild the modules have changed, and that's what we've got. Um, that basically is it. As far as I'm aware, the um, the timestamp based change checking was the only remaining impediment to easy incremental CI builds with Haskell, uh, which I'm very very pleased about because what that means is that it's now very easy to set that up in almost any Haskell project. Um, so I'll just give you one example quickly. Um, this is something that you might do if your CI is based on GitHub Actions. Um, that's just the one that I happen to be most familiar with right now, but um, I'm sure you can do something similar with many other setups. So um, I'll just like briefly go over what this is actually saying in case you're not familiar with GitHub Actions. What it's saying is that you'd like to cache the dist new style directory. Um, so at the end of a build, uh, you want that to be saved. And then at the start of the next build, you want that to be restored. Um, the dist new style directory is where Cabal stores the build products, um, assuming you're using a uh, recent enough version of Cabal and you're using the like normal interface where you write Cabal build as opposed to like the setup one. Um, now the key is what identifies the cache. Um, and so what we've done is we've put the operating system in because these things, these caches generally aren't gonna be able to be transferred across different operating systems. We've got the GHC version in the cache key as well. That's the matrix.ghc thing um, that Again, these caches won't work across GHC versions. And finally, we have the GitHub SHA. And the reason for that is that um, if the cache key hasn't changed, then GitHub will skip uploading the cache at the end of the build. For what we're doing, we really need the cache to be uploaded at the end of every build. So we need to include the commit SHA um, so that um, GitHub uploads the cache. Um, and then Harry, finally, Harry, oh, sorry, Harry, yeah. we do have a question if I can mm -hmm. uh, re read it out to you. What about the file? The, what about files content hash collisions? That would that would be fail when I would use this approach and my fix would be missed by the JC because the change caused hash collision. This would be a significant problem in case of CD pipelines. Yeah, that's correct. Um, if if you have a hash collision, then GHC is going to incorrectly determine that um, the uh, the file is up to date when it's not. I think um, I think the risk of this in practice is pretty low. It's um, it's very, very difficult, I think, to imagine this happening accidentally. Um, especially given that a Haskell source file has to like um, well, uh, has, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the the source file has to contain valid Haskell code as well for this to work. So, like, um, if if the source file can't be passed, then you're not going to get as far as um, trying to decide whether or not you need to recompile it. So, you need to find not only like a hash collision, but also a hash collision which passes as valid Haskell code, right? Um, I, uh, yeah, I've not heard of this ever coming up in practice. I think if I remember rightly, the algorithm is MD5, um, which of course is not good in like context where you're worried about security, but I'm not sure that this is one of them. Um, yeah, it's not something that I've thought a huge amount about, but yeah. 
um, yeah, of course, if, if the hash algorithm actually produced a hash that was two bytes, then it would be very, very likely that you'd see collisions. So thankfully, that's not what we're doing. Um, Great. Great. No, thanks for answering. So that's, that's all the questions there are at the moment. Thank you. Sure. Um, right, yeah. So, uh, and then the last thing to, to talk about with the uh, GitHub Actions config is the restore keys key. And what that's saying is that um, you're allowed to restore a cache if it's a prefix of that key. So essentially what we're saying by setting that restore key is that if you want to restore a previous cache, then the OS has to match and the GHC version has to match, but the GitHub shard doesn't necessarily have to match. Um, and that really like, if you have a, as long as you have a sort of um, relatively standard setup for a Cabal project, that should be all you need. Um, so yeah, I just, I really wanted to like get the word out about this. I think um, probably quite a lot of people stand to benefit quite a lot from this, um, especially because most CI services do have some kind of caching mechanism that you can use built into them. So um, yeah, that that's basically it for my talk. Um, thank you for listening. And I implore you uh, not to settle for slow CI um, for whatever reason. Of course, the lack of incremental builds in Haskell is just one reason that your CI can be slow, but um, it's, yeah, life's too short to be waiting for CI. Um, thank you for listening. Are there any more questions? Great. Great. Thank you so much, Harry, for an awesome talk. Um, yeah, let's see if there's any questions. So just to, sometimes there's a little lag with Twitch. Let's just see if it comes up. Any questions from you, Dimitri and Justin? I've got great talk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Harry, for the great talk. I have one question. Uh, was the performance impact measured in comparison to how quickly you can read timestamp and how quickly you can calculate the hash? Is there a significant difference there? Uh, yes, um, we did measure that. I um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it was slightly slower to to hash all of the files and um, uh, yeah as opposed to just checking the timestamps, because of course the timestamps are right there. Um, there's no computation necessary, but um, the the effect was pretty insignificant. Um, one thing about MD5 actually is that it's like, although it was kind of designed as a cryptographically secure hash function, and then it turned out not to be, um, you can compute it very, very quickly. I suppose, um, it is going to be on your CPU. You're not, I, well, I don't know. I don't know about using GPUs to crack hashes. I'm, I'm not um, an expert in that kind of thing. Maybe that's like more um, to do. Mm, yeah, I don't know. It happens on the CPU, but it's, it's pretty quick. It's basically imperceptible. Um, I, I tested it by making a project with like, I think 5,000, 10,000 maybe Haskell modules and the um, the no op build time. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, it, it felt acceptable to me. I, I think it was uh, less than half a second longer. Great. Great, no, thanks again, Harry. It was an awesome talk and thanks again for joining us to give the talk, really appreciate it. Uh, th th there's a lot of uh, 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 people saying great talk, thank, thank you in the, in, the, in the Twitch chat, but uh, the, I don't see any questions at this point. Sorry, uh, when, one last question. Uh, yeah. you, you implemented it for GitHub Actions, but um, it seems that it's just built into the compiler or Cabal. And so is it straightforward to use it with different uh, different build systems? Um, maybe I, when you say different build systems, are you thinking like something like Basil or Nix? 
um, just Jenkins. Um, maybe Circle CI instead of GitHub. Um, just different, um, a different host right. environment, or or it doesn't make much difference. I I guess is the question. Um, yeah, yeah. I um, so yeah, for Circle CI or Jenkins or whatever, um, it should be pretty much the same. Um, GHC shouldn't care like, or even really know whether it's been invoked by GitHub Actions or Circle CI or um, or anything. Um, all you really need is a mechanism to save the dist directory at the end of the build and then restore it at the next one. Um, there are some... Uh, it, it does get a bit more complicated if you're using something like Nix, of course, but that's because of stuff that's like specific to Nix. Um, and I'm not enough of a Nix expert to like, well, mainly I don't have time to give that a proper treatment. Any more questions, everyone, for Harry? Great, then. What, thanks again, Harry, for the great talk.